Well, we are in the second day of the Advent calendar season in the Dix household, and it's really quite an operation. Um, we have uh, three chocolate calendars, um, which is fair trade chocolate, don't worry. Um, so we've got three of the divine ca- uh, calendars. So there's one for each of the, the children who, who care about chocolate. Um, our youngest, um, number four, Judah, not yet being at the stage where he has tasted of this um, forbidden fruit. So he doesn't get to have the chocolate calendar. Um, he gets to watch his brothers opening um, the thing. But don't worry, because it also tells us about the Christmas story. The divine, uh, I can recommend then, it's not just kind of like... Father Christmas and reindeers and stuff, you find out a little bit more about what happens um, uh, about the Christmas story as they open a chocolate, um, which is great. And then there's a fourth calendar, which is actually beginning to... um, we're building up the scene uh, of the nativity. And you see there's a kind of a stable, and then you put in the... um, well, the baby comes last, but you get the star and you get the, the shepherds and whatnot. There's a few cats and things like that. I'm not quite sure how authentic that is. But uh, the, the, they have been, the boys have been so excited about Advent beginning. So much so that we've actually had a countdown to Advent, which is kind of funny because Advent is a countdown to Christmas. So we've kind of had, the, we've had a countdown to the countdown. And, and they've always been saying, when's Advent beginning? And don't worry, it's only like it's only three weeks away. Oh, goodness me. Um, um, but we finally arrived at Advent, which is the thing which is going to help us to finally arrive at Christmas, which was when everything goes absolutely crazy in the Dick's household, and we have to kind of, um, uh, we have to keep, keep control of things. But it reminded me of this, of this way in which the Christian life is about awaiting a and we don't just wait in one way, we wait in two different senses. And at the moment, we're, we're, in this, we're in this point when we're looking forward to Christmas, and Christmas being the point in which we consider afresh that most amazing miracle of all, that God, the Creator, would enter into His creation, would step down into creation, would become a part of it in order to save the whole thing in order to redeem and remake and make whole that whole creation, which has got out of step, which has got out of, um, out of kilter because of sin. And this most amazing miracle. But as we look forward to that, we're also waiting for something else. We're waiting for something, perhaps, we can't even begin to imagine how wonderful it will be. But you see, the message of the Christian faith is that Jesus, the king, is coming back. He's coming again. He's coming again to finally remake the creation. He's begun something in his life and his ministry, his death and his resurrection. He's begun to bring the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven to earth. But that will finally and fully happen when Jesus returns. And it's to that that we're putting our attention this morning. Because it's that which Paul is concerned with when he writes this letter to the Thessalonian church. Not just thinking about the the Lord's return, but it's something that fills Paul's mind as he writes to them. And so I'd love us to think about it today because Paul's got some particular concerns that he wants to uh, put to the the church in Thessalonica um, and to do with the way that they live in the light of the certainty of Jesus coming again. And they're really helpful for us to look at as we wait in this season of Advent, looking forward with expectation, not just to the celebration of Christmas, the coming of God as Emmanuel, God with us, but also that future hope that we still have, that Jesus is coming again. And for Paul... Everything starts with God and what God has done in Jesus, but then it flows through to his own experience and his relationship with these people, the church, the people that he loves so much. And so as we look at this verse, and it'd be great for you to just um, have it in front of you if you've got it on page um, 1122. What we see is that Paul is passionate about the Thessalonians. He's absolutely, he's just besotted with them. 
He loves them so much. This little passage that we've read is just the end point of, of, of a kind of, of a, um, a way that Paul has been pouring out his affection for that church over many, many paragraphs, so over different chapters. He, he, he says that um, in verse um, 17 of chapter 2, he describes himself as feeling orphaned when he was torn away from the church there, when he was separated them from the short time. And he says that he had an intense longing to see them again. And he made absolutely every effort to see them again. But he was prevented so. And as a result, in the, at the, ultimately he decided, I've just got to, I've got to do something about this. I'm desperate to know how these guys are doing. What was that all about? What was it that Paul was so passionate about for the Thessalonians? Well, it might be helpful to just have a little look back to Paul's mission to Thessalonica, which you can find out about in Acts, the book of Acts. And so if you want to turn to page 1050, then we'll find a little bit about the way in which the church in Thessalonica was started uh, and how Paul came to, to plant this church. And as a church plant ourselves, it really helps us to know the way in which a church plant ought to behave. And we can find a little bit about that from the church in Thessalonica. So Paul arrives in Thessalonica in the beginning of chapter 17 there on um, uh, of the book of Acts. And what Paul does, which is his custom when he goes uh, to, to a new place, is to see if there's a synagogue, a place where the Jews would gather to worship, because that would be his first port, point of contact, to go and proclaim that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah, the king of the Jews, but that he's different to what they've been waiting for. So he would go to the uh, synagogue first, and that's what he does in Thessalonica, if you look in verse 1. And so, uh, as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and then on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Paul says, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Well, the response to Jesus' message, uh, to Paul's message, rather, which is that there is a king who has come, and his name was Jesus. But this is not the king that they were necessarily looking for. No, he was a king who came in a different way. He came to bring a different kind of kingdom. He came to bring not a, an earthly kingdom, but a heavenly kingdom, the kingdom of God. And it would grow and it would expand and it would, it would, it would um, start like a seed, almost like a mustard seed or something that would be hidden. But then it would kind of subversively grow up until you, you could see what, it was, what was happening through the fruit of, of people's lives that were being changed. And this king would not first come in triumph, but he would come in suffering and death. And this is the way that Paul describes Jesus, this new kind of king, he had to suffer and die, but he would come through death. He would pass through death. He would burst through to the other side, to life again, to resurrection life. He would rise from the dead. Well, some of the Jews believed them, believed this message we find in verse 4 and they were persuaded and they joined this new church Paul and Silas would, had, had just planted this little church here with a few Jews who believed this message that Jesus was the long awaited king but that was not all that happened you see there were, there were others that, that, that heard the message as well outside of the Jewish community and so we find there described in verse 4 of, of Acts 17 there were some God fearing Greeks and some uh, women as well, some prominent women within the community. And so we find instantly this new little church plan is immediately characterized by diversity, by, by lots of difference. There were Jews, but there were also Greeks. There were non-Jews, there were Gentiles thrown together because they had a common belief that God was doing something new in his creation and he was doing it through Jesus. They believed that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was in fact God's king, the Messiah. And they wanted to put their trust in him so that they would be part of his kingdom. And there were, there were, there were women, there were men, there were kind of different kind of 
people from different stratas of society. There are prominent women, in, uh, in, so people with, with real positions of authority in the community. And there would have been the, just the, 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 the lowly as well. And they were all thrust together by their newfound faith. And the response of the city, Thessalonica was a big city. It was a prosperous place of a, a, you know, an interface between different trade routes. And um, as a result, it was a, a large metropolis. It had prospered for many, many years. The Romans had kind of, had, had, had kind of given it their blessing when they had conquered uh, Greece because it had sided with, with them. So it was on the right side of history. And as a result, it, it, was, it became a free city. Uh, and um, those who were Thessalonican, Thessalonians would be um, Roman citizens. So it was prospering in this new age of Roman rule. And, and in that place, this new church had been planted, a place which said that there was a new king. There was a different king. And they began to upset people. They began to kind of rile people, get people's backs up because of the way that they were living and because of the claims that they were making about Jesus. And so there these, these people come and they grab the nearest Christian they can find. They can't find Paul and they can't find Silas, but they can find a guy called Jason. And so they rushed to his house, they grab him and they pull him in front of uh, the authorities. And verse 6, they, 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 they drag Jason and some other believers before the city officials and they shout, these men have caused trouble all over the world. And they've now come here. We need to be careful because they're causing all sorts of problems and we won't have it in Thessalonica. We will not have it here. We won't have them upsetting the way that things are. Because the way that things are, are perfectly fine by us. And they've come here, and Jason, this person, has welcomed them into his house. They're all defying Caesar's decrees. They're upsetting the status quo. And they're saying that there is another king. One called Jesus. Uh, as a result of this... Um, the church experiences a lot of persecution. Paul and Silas are smuggled out of the city and they go on to um, other parts of Macedonia and eventually Paul gets to, to Athens uh, and um, the, his, missionary, um, um, his missionary journey continues. But what he's left behind is this little church community who have believed the message that there's a new king, there's a different king, there's another king who is not like the kings of this world, and he's bringing a kingdom which is not like the kingdoms of this earth. And they've come into that kingdom, and they're living differently, and they're upsetting people. And Paul's literally just had to escape in a basket, and that's the last time he's seen them. And so it's from Corinth that he writes to them in all likelihood. He's just thinking, how are they doing? He writes to them because he's, he's heard a message. He sent Timothy to the church to just to check that they're okay. And Timothy's brought back a report which says they are doing well, but they're, they're, there's, there is, there's a danger. They could get just so kind of pushed down by people around them persecuting them that they might go back on, on their faith that they've, that they've declared. And so Paul wants to write to them to just share his heart with them. And this letter, 1 Thessalonians, is probably where we see Paul's heart laid bare like no other. It's so affectionate. It's Paul as a pastor saying, I love you guys. I want to be with you. It's, it hurts so much to be away from you. But Paul does more than just say, I'm so sorry I can't be with you. He raises their sights and he says, what you have put your trust in is totally, totally reliable and trustworthy and I want to encourage you that you've done the right thing. And the reason I am convinced that your faith is solid and that it will not be disappointed is because Jesus is a king who is coming back, who is returning for the ones that he loves, who've put their trust in him. And in the meantime, here's how I want you to live.
And so he prays for them. And in verse 11 of 1 Thessalonians, if you want to skip back to there, Paul prays this beautiful prayer. And he says, um, first of all, may God make a way for me to be with you again, because that's what I long for. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. By the way, that's an impressive statement of who Jesus is. May our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus. Paul is clearly placing the Lord Jesus alongside God the Father there by praying to Jesus and saying, may the Lord Jesus make a way. That's an amazingly important, um, if you like, statement of Jesus as God's son, as part of the Trinity. But then he goes on to pray for the Thessalonians as well. He says, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, even as mine does for you. Paul is saying that um, when God has become the center of your life, when Jesus has become king in your life, you will find that something starts to happen that begins right in the middle of you, but that doesn't stop right there. It begins to bubble up and it begins to overflow. And that thing is God's love. God's love is, is so transformational that it changes the way you feel. It changes the way you, 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 you are at the level of your heart. And, and what God puts inside of you overflows out, out of you and it overflows to the people around you so first of all may the Lord make your love increase so it's what God does he makes your love increase and then it overflows may it overflow for each other so the church community must be characterised by God's overflowing love it's a sign that we are Jesus' disciples Jesus says that, that the world would know that you're my, my disciples because you have love for each other. Because you display love. But then that love does not remain constrained by the church's boundaries. You know, it doesn't just stay within the cosy walls of, uh, of a little group that wants to be set apart and be different. No, Paul says, and then may it overflow for everyone else. Just remember that Paul is writing to a, to a people who have been really beaten up and persecuted because of their faith in Jesus. And, Jesus is say, um, and Paul is saying, I want you to love them. I want that love that God has put inside you to overflow to these people. I want you to live differently. We can only live differently because of the kind of king that Jesus is. Because Jesus is a king who loves in that way who loves those who hate him he loved us even when we didn't love him he loved us so much that he died for us even when we there was nothing attractive in us in our essence and so Paul in, 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 in another verse in, in Romans he says God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God shows his love. By loving that which is not lovely. To make it lovely. To, to transform it. That's the kind of love that we're talking about here. Transformational love. That's the love that God has shown for us, for you and for me. He's loved us by giving his son for us. Even while we were still sinners, God loved us so much that he gave his son, Jesus, to die for us. And that's a very different love to any other kind of love. I mean, I go so as far as to say that what was created in the lives of the early Christians was something that had never been seen before. Nobody had ever defined love in that way before. 
Nobody had ever defined love as sacrificial, self-giving, self-emptying almost, love for another, to make it lovely, to make it something valuable and precious. This was a unique thing, and that's why um, sometimes this kind of love is, was, was defined as charity. Um, and it's used, often the word love is translated as charity in the King James Version, because it's, that, it's got that kind of feel to it. You give away. Charity, we often think, is you know, like giving, giving to the poor, giving to needy. But it, it, it comes out of the word for love, and it's a uniquely Christian concept. So it was not considered a good or noble purpose to, to kind of to look after the weak, to look after the vulnerable and the poor in first century um, Roman Empire. It was not considered a good thing. It was very much a, a question of you know, the survival of the fittest, of the strong showing themselves to be strong and those that can't keep up well, would just get left behind or, or, or uh, would, would be forgotten. The Christians came and they showed something different. They showed something unique. They showed a love for that which was not considered lovely, that which was not considered even worthy. And people noticed it. Uh, and so the early Christians... Um, were described in this way. And Justin Martyr, one of the, one of the earliest of the, um, um, the church fathers, said this, we who used to value the acquisition of wealth and possessions more than anything else now bring what we have into a common fund and share it with anyone who needs it. We used to hate and destroy one another and refuse to associate with people of another race or country. Now, because of Christ... We live together with such people and pray for our enemies. He's saying that, that life used to be all about boundary lines, demarking who was in and who was out, who was acceptable and who was not, loving those who were part of the in crowd and frankly ignoring or even hating those who were outside. And everything changed because of Christ. Christ. So, so he says, because of Christ, we live together with these people and we pray for our enemies. That's the difference that the King Christ, the King Jesus made. And so, and famously, the Christians were known for the way they looked after the poor. They looked after those who had been forgotten and left behind. And, and there was one particular instance which, is, which has gone down in history as, as being a most remarkable thing. And there was a huge plague that swept across the ancient world and the whole of the Roman Empire in the third century. And Christians were the only ones who cared for the sick. And they did that at the risk of contracting the plague themselves. And you know, meanwhile, uh, the pagan neighbors and those around them would be throwing infected uh, um, members of their own family even into the streets before they died in order to protect themselves from the plague. From their point of view, it's not, it's not callous to do that. It's not callous, it's, it's important. You've got to look after yourself. You've got to make sure that you survive. You've got to make sure that you, that you don't imperil yourself. For the Christians, the opposite was true. Because of the king that we serve, because of the way Jesus has loved us, given up everything for us, loved us to the end. Because of that, and because of the love, therefore, he's put in us, we've got to look after these people. It's not because it's a good work, it's because God's love compels us to live differently, to live in that way. But we do that ultimately because of a future hope. Because we believe that one day the world will be made well, will be made whole again. It's not a futile act. It's not sort of, um, sort of trying to keep the tide out perpetually, knowing it's, it's just going to roll in again. 
is we do these acts of love. We, we, we give ourselves to those around us. We display love for one another because ultimately we know that there will be a triumph of love. And that is founded in the hope, the sure knowledge that Jesus is coming again. And it's that which strengthens us. That's why Paul says in verse in 13, he finishes his prayer for the Thessalonians by saying this, that he prays, may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. He, so Paul is praying that we would be strengthened to be blameless and to be holy. To live out our calling, to live in the love of God, to let it increase and overflow from within us to those in the church, to those in the world. Because it's part of our preparation. It's part of us getting ready for what's coming. And what's coming is the Lord Jesus. He's coming with his holy ones. And when we sing about it, which we did today, and, and when we experience the, 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 the power of God's presence with us, it's, it's not a vain attempt to, to put our hope in something that really we're not quite sure about. It is actually the sure knowledge of what God will do. He's proclaimed it. He's, he's, shown, it, he's shown us this by the raising of Jesus from the dead. And we live in the light of that fact. It's the thing that changed all of history. And we enjoy God's presence here with us today. We experience his love filling us and pushing us out, overflowing into the community, into the world that so needs to experience his love because we know that Jesus is coming again and his kingship, his kingdom, will finally fully be established in the world. And in a moment, we're going to share that love, the love that God poured out for us in Christ as we share communion together, and Rick's going to lead us in that. But as we do so, and we feed in our hearts on his presence, on his love for us that was poured out on the cross, we, just, we don't just give thanks, and we don't just remember. We also put our trust and our hope in him for the future and we pray may we be filled may we experience God's filling and increase and an overflow of his love and may we be made blameless and holy as we look forward to that day Amen